So don't forget to mute your microphone. Hello, everybody. I think you can ah, all yes. hear me. <laughs> and welcome. We're going to start in a, in a minute. Ah, We're yes. waiting for a bit more participants to join. So welcome everyone. Uh, as people are joining, I, I just uh, uh, slowly start uh, the introduction. So welcome to this webinar, methodolo methodological approaches, uh, methodological research on approaches to gender data collection. And this is the first webinar of our series of the Africa Gender Data Network, an initiative uh, that I will introduce to you in a minute. Uh, welcome to all. Let me see. Uh, people are still joining slowly. All right, let's continue. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope everybody's safe. My name is Maryam Ait Uyahya, and I will be your moderator for today. I am the coordinator of the Africa Gender Data Network, an initiative by uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa and Data2x, and we are working actively with Open Data Watch. And I would like to openly thank them today for their continued support to the network. So the network was launched uh, one year ago in March 2019. And the overall, um, the overall uh, purpose of the network is to support African countries is to support African countries in the production and use of gender statistics and also uh, uh, in the communication of and about gender statistics. And for this, we try to connect our, our member to a wider a global communities that has an interest in gender data. We also try to uh, strengthen our members' capacities uh, in the, um, uh, by fostering gender data expertise and uh, facilitating cross-country learning and enabling uh, capacity building and training. And we have a platform where we share uh, resources that are of interest to our members all in one place. We also try to ensure that our members are aware of the lat latest methodologies uh, to close common gender data gaps. And this brings me back to our webinar today. So the, the, the main focus of our webinar today would be on met methodological advancements in the production of gender statistics. And we have a great hour in front of us with our two uh, distinguished uh, guest speakers who will share their experience and um, uh, their expertise in how to uh, uh, improve uh, uh, gender, uh, to ensure that or to uh, reduce gender data bias in uh, designing surveys. So after that, we will hear from you, our audience, uh, with your question to the panelists. And before we start our official program, I would like to share with you a few logistics. So first, uh, this webinar is being recorded and we will share the link and video with you afterwards. Also, uh, uh, at the bottom of your webinar screen, you will find a menu uh, with a Q&A box and please add in your question uh, during the presentation so we can select a few and uh, post them to the panelists. Also, last, uh, if you want to reach out after the webinar, uh, if you have question on the network, uh, the Africa Gender Data Network or any other question, please feel free to email me. Uh, uh, we look forward to stay engaged with you. And I will add my email for those who don't have it in the, in the chat box. All right. So let's now start with our official program. Uh, you will all know if you are familiar with gender uh, statistics, 
that the production of gender uh, statistics is not limited to data disaggregation and that ideally it should also include uh, all the steps in the data production process. So it means that ideally the formulation of uh, concepts and definition should adequately reflect the should adequately reflect um, the diversities in women and men in society, and also uh, that the data collection uh, ideally should uh, uh, take into account stereotypes and also uh, cultural and social factors that can bring uh, gender-based uh, uh, biases. And this is where our uh, two uh, uh, expert speakers uh, will intervene as uh, they have extensive experience in uh, these domains. Uh, they will share with us um, uh, some good practice in standard settings and also on how to reduce uh, uh, gender-based ba uh, gender biases in designing surveys. And our first uh, speaker uh, is Elisa Benes. Uh, she is a senior statistician with the Labor uh, Force Survey Team at the International Labor Organization. And she, she has extensive experience in uh, international standard settings, has whole methodology survey and testing. And she was responsible for the, uh, for the adoption of the 19th International Conference of Labor Statistician Standards on uh, statistics of work, employment, and labor underutilization. And she's now co-leading ILO's uh, Labor Force Survey uh, testing work uh, to provide guidance and tools in support of countries. Our second guest speaker, uh, Heather Moylan, uh, is a survey specialist with the Living Standard Measurement uh, Study Team at the World Bank, and she's an expert in the uh, design, implementation, data quality control, and also analysis of, of household surveys. And she's currently overseeing uh, the uh, implementation of uh, the Living uh, Standard Measurement uh, Study uh, act activities in Malawi, as well as other um, uh, field-based uh, method methodological uh, experiments. So as you see, we have uh, uh, two uh, big experts here. And welcome to both of you. Uh, I'd like now to turn to Elisa, uh, who will be our first speaker today. And she will present the latest ICLS uh, uh, standards on statistical work uh, and also highlight how uh, they are made gender relevant. She will also share some key guidance uh, in how to uh, uh, improve uh, surveys to incorporate a gender length. So over to you, Elisa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for having us here. Um, and I will like to say hello to everybody wherever you are. It's a pleasure for me to be here and it's an honor as well to participate in this webinar. I will be now sharing my screen so uh, we can get started. So give me just one second. Very well, just to confirm, do, do you see the screen? Yes. Yes, very well. So, as, as uh, Miriam was mentioning, I will be talking about uh, how ILO has been working to integrate a gender perspective in work and labor market statistics, talking from the international concepts to some of the work we have done to improve the data collection itself. Uh, so I will go a little bit in depth into what are the key features of the latest standards that were adopted uh, on work and labor on the utilization that are relevant from a gender perspective. Uh, then I'll talk about the range of pilot projects that we have been doing in the last few years. I'll highlight a few findings, not many, but a few findings that really have been critical for improving the measurement of women's work, both paid and unpaid. And I'll talk about some of the guidance that we're now giving for reducing gender biases in data collection in labor statistics. At the end, you have resources in case you want to look more in depth at any of the topics that I will be talking about. So as I, as I mentioned, ILO plays an important role in setting standards internationally on labor statistics. We do this through the conference, International Conference of Labor Statisticians. 
this is a very large conference that meets every five years and brings together uh, representatives from governments that includes national statistical offices and ministers of labor, workers and employers uh, groups, and as well as international organizations. They meet every five years to discuss and agree on international standards that then set what is the definition for employment, for work, for informal work, and, and the practices of how to measure this. So uh, this is one of the important roles where we are addressing gender biases and concepts in international standards. Uh, we also do labor force survey research and testing to then bring those standards into the ground and identify the best ways to collect the information aligned with those standards. Uh, for that, we use both qualitative and quantitative testing methods. And we often work uh, for these with national statistical offices and with development partners, uh, including the World Bank here today. Uh, another important aspect of our work is technical assistance and capacity building. And uh, this is a way that we then promote the good practices and share um, the concepts and how to measure them with countries around the world. And uh, finally, we also compile the information and disseminate it globally. Um, ILO is uh, custodian for a number of SDG indicators, in particular on SDG 8, on decent work and economic growth, but also under other SDGs indicators. So we compile that information and make it available. Uh, but we also are very, very actively working on improving the dissemination from a gender perspective. So we have special gender tabulations, for example, by household composition and by other characteristics to, to highlight gender issues in the world of work. And we are also promoting um, wider audience, uh, messages to wider audience to understand the key findings, the key features, uh, and the gender differences in, in the world of work through blog stories. So moving to the standards. So we have since 2013 an updated set of standards uh, that basically define what we understand as work and employment and how we measure labor underutilization. And these are the standards that are behind uh, key indicators such as the employment rate, the unemployment rate, uh, and, and measures of un unpaid work. These standards uh, replace the old standards that we had from 1982 that were the basis for most countries reporting employment and unemployment rates. Uh, and what we did in 2013 was to majorly upgrade them to address some very basic gender biases that were embedded in the old standards. In particular, um, the old standards, you may have heard about the economically active population and the inactive population. Uh, that, those were the old concepts that were used, but we didn't have a concept of work that capture all activities that are productive, whether they're paid or not. So these standards address those changes, recognize all productive activities, paid and unpaid, including caring for one's own home, cooking, and all the services that one does unpaid in the household as work. Uh, we also uh, adopted a framework that uh, took into account the gender differences in the way women and men look for work and the barriers that they have to finding jobs or to being available to have jobs. And that is important for the unemployment indicators and, and other indicators of labor underutilization. Um, so these standards are important because uh, not only they are for macroeconomic mo monitoring and to inform uh, you know, GDP estimates and satellite account estimates, but also to inform the creation of, of jobs, uh, labor market programs to reach to different populations, but also issues about work-life balance and social inclusion. So, so they have a very basic immediate use in policy making. And they are now the basis for the reporting on, on, on goals eight, in particular, decent work and economic growth, but also have relevance for some of the indicators under the gender equality goal five. So what did these standards do? The first thing is that for once, uh, we had the first internationally agreed definition of what is work. And this definition recognizes any activity that is to produce goods or services, whether for oneself, one's family, or for the market, as work. And this recognizes all productive activities, whether formal, informal, legal, or not legal, as productive if they are producing goods or services. And, and this was very important because then it expanded to recognize all the services that are done on paid as work. Uh, and, it's, and another important dif difference is that it recognizes that there is work, 
but then there are different forms of work and not all employment is work. So we have a forms of work framework that we now use to collect statistics and create indicators that target different forms of work. So work, that means activities that are to produce goods or services that are for own use by oneself or one's household or family, they're considered own use production work. And this includes both goods and services. So caring for the family, cooking, uh, fetching water, collecting firewood, growing food to, to eat oneself, um, um, fixing the house, all of that is considered own use production work. So now we can have regular collection of data on people and the time they spend in these activities uh, and recognize it as work. Now work that is done for others with the intention of receiving a remuneration, so for a payment or to generate an income, for example, through profits from a business, that's what's considered employment. This is a smaller definition that we had before, and it really concentrates on income generating work. And so we can have uh, indicators now of the labor market that tell us how many people, how many women versus men have access to employment opportunities that generate income, whether formal or informal, but that generate income. So this is employment. And now we also recognize other forms of work that are done for others, but not for remuneration. And here, very importantly, is on paid training work. So apprenticeships, traineeships, uh, very important usually for youth, for the youth population that are done without remuneration. So they do it in the context of learning an occupation, a skill, a profession, but they do not get remunerated. Uh, and then another important one recognizes volunteer work, work that is done to help others without expecting to receive any income and to benefit others. But it can be done through an organization like nonprofits, but also directly in communities such as community or traditional work that is done on a village, for example, to help each other. Uh, so these are the different forms of work that have been recognized and now we are developing statistics on each so countries can have information about what kinds of work people do and how differently they contribute to the economy, to their livelihoods, but also um, to well-being in, in, in the end. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, we had a framework, an updated framework for labor underutilization. Uh, as you will know, in, in labor force statistics, we had these concepts of economically active and economically inactive. Now we talk about labor force and outside the labor force. And for those, we usually had just the indicator of unemployment to capture people who didn't have jobs, who were seeking jobs, and that was not sufficient. We had many people, particularly women, that would fall outside the labor force, that they would not be either considered employed or unemployed. Well, the new standards recognize that there are many people outside the labor force that have interest in the labor market and they have some attachment, but they are not in a situation where they can be either looking for work or available for work for many reasons. So we have identified new indicators to capture this group and we call it the potential labor force. And it's a very important indicator, not only for women, but also for youth and for, and for uh, rural areas, because the labor markets in those areas are, are ones where there are not many opportunities for seeking employment. So the recommendations are now that not just to use unemployment rate, but to look at these other aspects of, of people outside the labor force that have an interest in employment, as well as people that are already in employment, but have few hours of work. So they are managing to find jobs, but they will not have sufficient quantity of work as they would want to. And this is what we call indicators of labor on the utilization that look at really capturing people with an unmet need for employment. So these are the, the two broad changes to the basic concepts in, in, in labor statistics and in work statistics. Uh, we've also updated the terminology, so we no longer talk or recommend using economically active or inactive. Why? Because many persons that are not in jobs that generate income are still productive, are doing uh, many activities that are work. They're just unpaid. So we no longer use this bias in language either. And we also recommend now looking also at various kinds of reasons why people are not in the labor market that also recognize the different roles that people have to play in society, in particular for women. Um, many will say, I am not able to work more hours, I am not able to look for a job because I have 
family responsibilities because I'm caring for children or altogether because my family doesn't allow me to work. So we recognize the importance of looking in analysis at gender related barriers to employment. So altogether, the standards come together now to allow us to see the various activities paid and unpaid that both women and men do so we can recognize how we contribute each gender contributes to well-being and to the economy how work is divided among members in a household so who are the members that do wage work who are the members that do subsistence work who are the members that uh, care for the family and how that contributes to the livelihood of the household in general uh, but also the various barriers that people in different responsibilities doing different forms of unpaid work have in order to access uh, employment and income generating work. So this is why it's very important the changes that happened in 2013 from the standard side. Now what ILO is doing to promote countries to adopt these standards and produce statistics that reflect these differences in, in both employment and own, uh, own paid work is uh, uh, to promote the use of a modular service and we focus in particular on labor force service because that is the basic survey that is used for labor force statistics uh, but to add topics that on a different frequency collect specific information for for example volunteer work for subsistence work for unpaid care and domestic work and so we are piloting to develop these modules that will allow countries to have information on a more frequent basis on these various forms of work. Which kinds of testing we have done? Uh, we've been working on a number of projects since 2015. Uh, we first did a 10, pilot, 10, 10 country pilot study that looked at the core of the labor force information, so how to collect employment, labor under utilization, and subsistence production, so own use production of goods in a labor force survey according to the new standards. We worked uh, with 10 countries, four in Africa, two in Asia, two in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and two in Latin America. And from there, we have issued now guidance on how to improve measurement of, this, of these topics. Uh, then in 2017, we started a collaboration with World Bank and Data2x under the Women's Work and Employment Partnership. And we are testing in Sri Lanka. And here we're looking at how to apply the standards in different surveys and how to promote coherence. In particular, we're looking at the labor force survey and the living standard measurement survey. Results are coming this summer, and so we expect to update our guidance based on the results from this pilot. We have also pilots on volunteer work uh, with UN volunteers, and we are very excited to start this next month a, a new project on unpaid care and domestic work where we will be looking at light time use methodologies and how they could be included with labor for service to capture unpaid care and domestic work more regularly. So this is what's coming ahead. So some of the key findings and, and what we have learned in, in these projects. Uh, one of the basic for labor for service and to identify employment is the need and the importance of having multiple questions. People have many different types of jobs and many people will, will right away self-identify as having a business or a job, but many others don't, especially if they are in informal activities, if they have small hour jobs, if they are helping in family businesses, they don't necessarily right away identify as having work. So we need to use several questions to identify these groups. Uh, what I'm showing you in the table is the results from the 10 country pilot studies where we looked at five different questionnaires, the M1 to M5 is five different questionnaires we tested. And these were based on the differences in, in different regions, how they measure employment. And we looked at the relevance of each question to identify everybody that is with a job. And we identified that usually the main question, do you work for pay or do you have a business? It's, uh, it's, it works fairly well, but it captures around 80 to 90% of the employed, not everybody. And it works better for men than for women. We lose women employed if we only use that question. So for women, if we want to really capture the diversity of their jobs and, and the circumstances in the labor market, we need to ask recoveries for small jobs. Did you do anything, for example, sell things, cook things for sale, uh, any kind of trading, and then we can recover another group. 
it's very important for women. Do you help in a family business? Many times if we say, do you work in a family business? They will not recognize it. Uh, we often have to use the language in that way to self-identify. Uh, and this, these are critical for having even identification of, of women and in employment. Another important uh, lesson we learned was that it's very easy to mis misclassify family helpers. Uh, once we have them identified as employed, then we ask them, okay, are you working for someone else in your own business, helping in the family business? And that way we know if they're self-employed employees and so on. Uh, what we learn with working with uh, interviewing family helpers is that we also have to ask them, what do they do in the family business to really reflect their role? Many of family helpers are actually business cooperators. They are making major decisions about the business. They are involved in day-to-day -day administration. They are deciding on income and they are regularly working uh, so, uh, hours in the, in the business. So they're not just family helpers. We need to ask these additional questions to recognize that they have a leading role as business cooperators as well. So that's very important for us in classifying the type of work that women do. Um, another final point that I want to share with you that we have learned is the importance of looking at reasons, gender differences in the reasons for not entering the labor market or not having uh, more work. For example, many women tend to be more in, working part-time or low, lower hour jobs, and it is the, the responsibility for taking care of the family. So if we look at differences between women and men employed who are saying, I'm working less than my usual, so I'm underemployed in that moment, uh, a, a greater percentage of women will say it's because of family responsibilities. Similarly, among the not employed, we have a large group of, of, of persons that would say they want to work and are available but are not looking. And it's more common for women to say they're not looking because of family responsibilities. And similarly, for those who are looking uh, but not available, again, a much higher percentage. So this is the type of gender analysis that one has to do in order to make sure that uh, differences, the, the targeting of, of policies to help women be able to access employment would be different once we know why are the reasons they are not trying to enter the labor market or work more hours. So what are some of the key messages in terms of reducing gender biases in data collection? Very important for us is instrument design. It's so important in, in, in labor statistics to have probing questions so we can characterize, really identify the different types of jobs that women do. Uh, examples that refer to women's activities that are likely to go underreported. Uh, make sure that we have the topics included that will characterize their contributions and working conditions. Uh, and of course, testing before survey data collection. The way we word questions matters a lot in terms of uh, both men and women recognizing what we're asking. In terms of field operations, being involved in interviewer training. So for gender focal points, raising awareness about the concepts, the activities that are likely to go underreported, the expectations and roles that women play so that uh, the, the interviewers are aware and can handle this in the field. Having mixed teams, men and women, so you have a balance in the way that the information is collected, Avoid proxy respondent to the extent possible, have the persons themselves respond about their situation. And of course, reduce the interview and interpretation so that there are no assumptions going into data collection, but rather giving them the questions the way they're meant to be read so that they don't introduce biases in data collection. For reporting, as Marion was already saying, go beyond disaggregation by sex. Really, we need deeper analysis of reasons, family context, uh, granularity in the in the analysis because that's where we find the gender differences that really inform policy. So thank you very much. I hope this has been helpful. We ha I have a number of resources and uh, tutorials in particular that could be very interesting for some of you. Otherwise, practical tools that have come out of these pilots and and some information on the new tabulations that we're doing that really highlight gender issues in the world of work. Thank you. Mike.
Miriam, I think you're muted. Very sorry. I'm, I'm, my first experience at moderating a webinar, so I apologize. I make a lot of mistakes. So thank you very much, Elisa. I was saying uh, how informative and uh, enlightening was your uh, uh, presentation. It was uh, very good. Uh, I'm now turning uh, over to uh, Heather. Uh, she will share with us uh, what exactly is the Living Standard Measurement Study Project uh, Plus study plus project and she will share with us some fieldwork experiences and also uh, guidance on how to improve uh, uh, individual disaggregated data collection in the household surveys and why does it matter so thank you and over to you heather Great, thank you so much, Miriam. Um, good morning, good afternoon to all of you logged on here, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's my pleasure to be here, and Miriam, thanks so much for organizing and inviting me. Uh, so let me go ahead and share the screen. Okay. So I'll be presenting work uh, that we're doing as part of what we're calling the LSMS Plus program. So as Miriam said, I work with the Living Standards Measurement Study Team at the World Bank. And we started to work more in individual disaggregated survey data collection. And the work that we're doing as part of the LSMS Plus is scaling this work up now as part of national surveys. So I'm presenting on behalf of Talib Kilik and myself. You may have seen one or the other of us present this work elsewhere. Um, but really driving this is, of course, no one on the call today needs to be convinced that uh, gender equality is smart economics, right? Evidence shows that empowering women fuels economies, spurs robust, robust growth, um, and of course, we, see, we still see persistent gender inequities in economics, social, and political life. And if we really want to start tackling these problems, we really need to get at individual disaggregated data. So we know that the type of research that we need to do to, to target these inequities relies on this individual level, speaking to women, gender disaggregated data. Um, many, many of the SDGs now, of course, are focused on women. And so some of the SDGs that we'll be talking about throughout the presentation today are the, the two SDGs on the right here that you see, 142 and 581, so talking about land tenure, and then also 852, so you know, looking at the unemployment rate by sex, and many of these other SDGs that we need to do um, at the individual level, at the individual level. Um, so household surveys like the LSMS, the LSMS style surveys, is really an important source of this type of data collection, but there really is significant room for improvement. So in these surveys, you know, you're typically relying on the most knowledgeable person in a household or who is deemed to be the household head and asking them all of the questions about different members of the household. Um, so we really need to move away from this type of proxy respondent reporting and also make sure that, you know, oftentimes in household surveys, you'll see many people grouped around the house while an interview is being conducted. And so we also want to focus more on private interviews. Um, even as part of the LSMS ESA program, so the integrated surveys on agriculture. So this is where we've been focused on just several different countries in Africa. Um, where we have a focus on collecting data at the individual level. Here you see some figures from our labor modules. So these are surveys across the LSMS ESA where you can see in Mali, you know, it gets up to 98% of data is collected by a proxy respondent for for the labor module. Tanzania is one of the stronger countries, but even there you can see that for females, 18% of the time is reported by a proxy. So we can see even in surveys where this is a focus, we really need to focus even more on getting the self-reported information. So the good news is that really momentum has been building now on improving this individual dis disaggregated survey data. Um, one of the main programs that the LSMS the LSMS team, Talib and myself, have been working on is ownership and control of assets. So back in 2014, we conducted a survey, conducted a methodological experiment in Uganda focused on respondent selection to say, okay, who should we be asking if we want to understand who in a household has ownership and rights to different physical and financial assets? So that fed then into the UN guidelines for producing statistics on asset ownership from a gender perspective, which the recommendations coming out of that work then fed into um, these other guidelines um, on measuring individuals' right to land. So this 
this work program at Financial and Physical Assets has really moved quite, quite far in the last several years, but there's still additional work to be done. Additionally, as Lisa was presenting, um, there's been a lot of work on the new definitions of work and employment. And so she mentioned that there's been a partnership between other members of the LSMS team and the ILO and Data2x to try to figure out how to ask about these new definitions of work and employment in, in LSMS-style surveys. And then finally driving the, the LSMS Plus program is the world-based IDA 18 commitment to pilot data collection in at, in at least six IDA countries. And so this is gathering direct respondent inter-household level information on employment and assets. So that brings us to the LSMS Plus program. So the LSMS Plus is a partnership between the development data group, so that's where the LSMS team sits, and the gender group at the World Bank. And this is to meet the IDA 18 gender data commitment. The first set is focusing on data production. So we've been working in six IDA eligible countries to collect this individual level gender disaggregated data. And in, in these six different surveys, these six different countries, we've been aiming to interview all adults within a household. So when we go into a household, identify all adult members and try to interview them in private with a gender matchup between the respondent and the enumerator. Um, and if possible, simultaneously, so that there's no information exchanged between, between household members. Uh, and then of course, this, this data will be publicly disseminated at, at the end of the LSMS Plus project. Um, additionally, we're focused on technical assistance. So we really want to make sure that we're assisting NSOs with collecting this type of data. Um, so providing advice on the, you know, the CAPI survey design, and fieldwork implementation, and how it's been done so that countries can learn learn from those that have conducted this type of work before them. And then finally, a large component of this is the policy and research that will come out of it. So not only do we want to provide updated methodological and operational guidance, but we also want to, we'll also have a series of different methodological research papers to showcase many of the findings that have come from this work. So, so far we've worked in Malawi, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. These were the first three LSMS Plus countries. They're all also part of the LSMS ESA program. So we have a long history of working with these national statistical offices. And then we've also expanded beyond that to Cambodia that finished their data collection in the fall. And then Nepal and Sudan will be two countries that will, will hopefully go back to the field soon, as soon as uh, we get past the current crisis. Um, so we've worked in, so these are our six LSMS Plus countries. Um, we work directly with the national statistics, statistics offices to make sure that they're implementing this as part of a national survey that they're already conducting. Um, and you, you'll just note that most, the majority of these countries, we've used the in-house uh, survey solutions platform. So we do actually have tools available for other countries um, that want to start supporting this type of data collection. So actually these modules have already been built on the survey solutions platform. Um, you'll see that the core, the core topics that we cover are asset ownership, employment, and non-farm enterprises. Um, and then education, health, and labor are modules that we've always had as part of the LSMS or LSMS ESA style surveys, um, but now that focuses even more on interviewing the individual themselves rather than a proxy respondent. So in terms of asset data collection, so land, financial accounts, and mobile phones have been covered in all six of of the LSMS Plus countries. And then as the, as the program has progressed, we added livestock, apartments and condos, and then durables. And for all of these different types of assets, we always ask about reported ownership. So it's just simply, do you own a particular type of asset? We also ask about economic ownership in the case of land and apartments and condos. And so this would be in the, in the if you were to sell this parcel today, who would be the decision maker on how that, how that money is used? And then documented ownership is asked for land, financial accounts, and apartments and condos. So, you know, asking is there a formal document for this asset and whose names appear on the document. And then finally, we ask about a bundle of rights. And so this includes the right to sell, bequeath, rent out, use as collateral, and make improvements and invest. And this is asked for land and apartments and condos. One note to make here is that we ask um, for all of these different types of ownership constructs, we ask uh, not only about joint owners within the household, but also if there's anyone outside of the household that owns a particular asset. And then in the case of the, diff the bundle of rights, we ask, does someone have the ability to 
um, to exercise this right independently, or do they need to ask someone for permission or consent? So I'll give a quick example here. So in terms of reported ownership for land, we would simply start with the question, do you own this particular parcel, either alone or jointly with someone else? If they say no, we are not going to ask any further questions about this parcel because we really want to ask only of those individuals that own a particular asset. If they say yes, then we'll ask whether is there anyone else inside the household that jointly owns this parcel with you? If they say yes, they'll, they'll list the additional household members. And if they say no, we'll still continue on and ask is there anyone outside of the household that jointly owns this parcel with you? If they say no, we just move on to the next ownership construct. And if they say yes, um, depending on the country, they'll either report the number of males and number of females to try to get that gender breakdown, or in some countries, they do have network rosters where they're actually specifically listing the outside, the outside of the household members as well. In terms of employment and enterprise data collection, so here the, the, the retail period is quite critical. Um, so we start these modules with a set of screening questions um, about the last seven days. So you know, asking about uh, are they involved in wage employment? Do they manage a non-farm enterprise? Do they help with a non-farm enterprise, etc.? Um, and then the intended destination when we ask about farming in particular. We also ask unemployment and job search questions about the last 30 days. And then we ask very de a very detailed set of questions about the primary wage job and the secondary wage job from the last 12 months. And then finally, we have ask uh, it, about searching for more or different work. And so we know here that it's the last 30 days, but some of the questions change to the call period. In terms of the household enterprise module, so one, and one critical aspect here is that it's linked to the employment module so you can match up to identify you know if an, if an individual is marked is working or managing a non-farm enterprise in the employment module and then link that to the, the enterprise later module that comes later so we ask a series of basic enterprise attributes we ask about seasonality um, so we cover the last 12 months so this um, you know of course captures seasonality in running these non-farm enterprises we ask about household and higher and higher labor inputs for the last month and then finally, profits, revenues, and costs also for the last month. Um, so, so Malawi was the first LSMS plus country, and we did this data collection back in 2016. And it actually allows us uh, for, to conduct the first set of research that, we, that we've that we put out as part of the program. Because in the case of Malawi, we actually implemented two national surveys concurrently. Um, so we had a cross-sectional sample, uh, which we just did the standard business as usual, asking the most knowledgeable respondent these different sets of questions, versus we had a panel sample using the same field teams, using the same field staff, where we implemented this now LSMS Plus gold standard approach. So asking individuals specifically about assets that they themselves own, you know, asking them, asking themselves about education, health, and labor. So looking at this gold standard versus business as usual approach side by side. In terms of the panel sample, so the LSMS Plus, we managed to get 79% of targeted individuals. Um, and on the right-hand side, you'll see just the breakdown of for each household out of these four adult individuals that we tried to interview, what was the success rate? So in 68% of households, we managed to interview all of the eligible individuals in the household. We also attempted, in the case of Malawi, to, to use this gender matchup, so to match a female respondent with a female enumerator and a male with a male. So we succeeded 80% of the time for male respondents and then 73% of the time for female respondents. Um, for, I, I think many of you will know that sometimes it can be hard to hire enough females to go to the field. So in the case of Malawi, they did their best for a 50-50 breakdown, um, but in other countries we've had more of a challenge with that. And then in terms of conducting private interviews, at the end of a module, they'll just simply identify whether or not um, they managed to interview the respondent in private or if anyone else was present, and 99% of the time we were successful. So we have two, two working papers that have recently come out um, in March on this work, or in February on this work. Um, so it's Talkulis, Gayati Kulal, and myself. Um, so the first is getting the gender disaggregated lay of the land. So this is looking at assets specifically. Um, so looking at ownership of agricultural land and what what we find is that when we're looking at the business as usual, business as usual approach 
versus this new gold standard approach, we actually see higher levels of exclusive, reported, and economic ownership. And for women, we see lower levels of joint reported and economic ownership. Um, we also looked at between a husband and wife that were both interviewed, are there discrepancies between what they're reporting? And we do see uh, that actually there's substantial agreement between the husband's wives in terms of land, in terms of the different ownership and rights constructs. Um, but we do see discrepancies, and this is usually when women have greater household status. Um, we find that it's, uh, it's more when women are attributing at least some land ownership to themselves. And so really the, the main message coming out of this is that there are significant differences. And so it really is highlighting the UN recommendations that it's how critical it is to in, in, interview an individual themselves. And then the second, the second bit of work that came out of Malawi, so you know, taking advantage of these two side-by-side -side surveys um, is, is unemployment. So it's a paper, are you being asked? And so it's looking at the impact of respondent selection on measuring employment. So we looked at we looked at a series of different indicators. So just these binary variables looking at is a person involved in wage employment, are they involved in managing non-farm enterprise, et cetera. And we see that when we look at the effect of these business as usual approaches, so trying to figure out what are we missing out on when we don't in interview an individual themselves, we see that for men there's lower reported wage employment and lower weekly hours in a crop agriculture. And then for women, we see higher weekly hours in wage employment. Uh, we also see lower reported employment in livestock and non-farm enterprise activity um, and weekly hours in livestock. And so these effects are stronger for women. And, and much of this is linked with household wealth as well as proxy reporting because of course in the case of labor, um, if an individual is not present to respond to the questions themselves, then we'll instead ask the proxy respondent. And then also the potential difficulties in interpreting questions about non-farm enterprises. Um, so just to finish up here, I'll just cover some of the some of the plans that we have for the LSMS Plus program. So of course, uh, coming up will be country data sets. So for Tanzania, Ethiopia, Cambodia, Nepal, and Sudan, Malawi is actually actually already posted on the World Bank microdata catalog uh, with links in this presentation. So I think it will be shared with all participants. Um, we also have a cross-country report in the works. So the first report will be on the first three LSMS Plus countries: so Malawi, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. And we're hoping to release that in June this year. Um, and so there, so there we really will provide operational and methodological guidance anchored in the field experience and research that we've done with the program so far. And then we'll also have country specific reports. So now with the later countries, the field work has been more spread out. So we don't want to sit on the results. So we'll release results from Cambodia, hopefully this coming June or July. And then Nepal and Sudan, as soon as we get back to the field, finish the field work and, and do some of the data analysis. And then along with the two research papers that I already shared coming out of the Malawi experience, um, we'll have a, a number of research papers as well that we hope to come out between July of this year and, and the following year. So we have a lot of great plans for the LSMS Plus program. Um, and so thanks so much for the opportunity to share this work uh, and happy to answer any questions that you may have about the field work experience that we've had so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank you very much. Uh, so now let's turn to um, uh, our panelists participants with their question. We have a, a few questions, so we won't be able to ask all of them. Uh, but let me turn first to Elisa. Uh, Elisa, how many countries are involved with the implementation of the ICLS-19, uh, and specifically uh, the one who uh, are addressing the gender aspect that you discussed? And also, if there is a link to that question, uh, if there is country in the global south that are champion uh, uh, for integrating these tools and uh, reporting and analysis. Thank you very much. You're, you can hear me, right? Yes. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you for your questions. So we did last year, we did a, a a review of where countries were in implementing the standards. Now, you can understand countries have different timelines when they are ready to update their labor force survey, the national labor force survey. 
there is a lot of activity. We already have a number of countries in each region that have already done the whole process of testing, implementing, explaining, discussing with their, with their constituents. So I, I cannot give you an exact number right now how many, but we do have several numbers of countries in each region that are, that are um, advancing. And we have also regions or sub-regions that are doing it together. Uh, right now, with the current situation in the world, there's been a number of, of uh, activities that's impacting majorly the labor force service. So we do have a number of, of processes that are stopping in place, um, but uh, hopefully it will be resolved. Um, in Africa, I, I can mention uh, some of the early adopters uh, included Rwanda. Uh, Zambia is already, is already testing. Also in West Africa, we had a number of countries that were already implementing um, Ivory Coast, I believe, the Gambia, Senegal was testing. So we have, we do know a number of countries. It takes a number of years for, for countries to introduce because there's a lot of testing that needs to happen. Um, in, in, the, in the Americas, we had uh, Brazil and Dominican Republic that implemented already. Mexico is getting ready to release in, in, in the summer, depending how things happen now. Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Uruguay, um, they were already in the process of, again, testing national tests, already so very advanced. In Asia, we have countries that are already implementing. Um, Nepal was in the process of implementing. Uh, Myanmar, Brunei Darussalam have already implemented. Uh, Thailand was implementing. So, so there's a variety. Uh, Vietnam has already implemented. Uh, East Timor is, has implemented and is implementing again. So, so we do see movement in that direction. And, um, and I don't recall now the second question. <laughs> so if, if you can remind me, what was the second part of the question? Uh, yes, I mean, I think you, you replied a bit. If they were like champions in the global south that, you know. Yes. That. Thank you. So let's me now turn to Heather. Heather, can you, um, let me put the spotlight back. Okay, uh, Heather, can you can you please uh, estimate the uh, increase in resources um, that are needed uh, to implement the LSMS plus uh, compared to the traditional uh, LSMS survey? Sure. So I'll again take advantage of the experience that we had in Malawi, where we ran the two surveys side by side. Um, so what we found, so in Malawi, um, the setup was the same. We used the same survey teams. They were implementing the gold standard and the business as usual approach side by side. So throughout the same seven month period. And so what we found is that it took 3.37 days for a team to visit an enumeration area um, and interview the households when using the business as usual approach. And then it took 4.51 days um, for the, the panel interviews. So when we were using this gold standard, trying to interview all individuals in the household. So having that comparison of understanding the number of days that it takes, it really starts to give an understanding of the cost comparison um, because really you have to work closely with the with the statistics office so that they can strategize on how best to carry out these these interviews so we were able to have that you know relatively small difference despite the addition of all these individual interviews because field teams worked very closely with their supervisors that when they went to an enumeration area for the first time um they they would go first go through and create the rosters for all of the different households, get an understanding of how many adults were in a household, how many males, how many females, and also try to get an understanding of when these people would be available for interview. So that then they could strategize to plan, okay, we'll go back to this household on this evening, make sure that we have a male and, and female uh, enumerator to interview the respondents when they're home from work, or it's someone that would only be available in the mornings. Um, so. So knowing that it takes about approximately one additional day per enumeration area can help statistics offices to, to gauge the, the type of additional cost that there might be. Great, thank you, Heather. I have now a question for, uh, for both of you. Uh, how does the use of technologies, and it would be the last question because then we will have to wrap up. Uh, how does the use of uh, technology in surveys uh, through CAPI, for example, affect the ability uh, to gather gender data disaggregated response and how these technology affect the logistics of conducting surveys? So 
Should, do I? Okay, I, I get started. <laughs> so I, I think moving to CAPI, it's a good move if the statistical office has the infrastructure to manage the data transfer and so on. There's a lot of improvements that, that take place in terms of data quality and, and uh, the service can be also better designed so that they seem more natural to the respondent. Uh, so there's a lot of gains if, if you can move to, to a CAPI system. Of course, for that, the statistical office needs to have the infrastructure for maintaining, for, for maintaining the programs, for being able to update them, for, for processing the information, for, for the data transfer aspect of it so that it is done in a, in a confidential way. Um, the connectivity needs to be available also in the region so that, and, and the systems in, in the field have to be in place so that the persons can go collect the information and transmit it. So that infrastructure needs to be there, but many countries are already moving in that direction. We do see an important switch in and, and use of technology to improve uh, the speed of the data. It also improves timeliness of processing and so on. So it's a, it's a good move. Sure, so I'll second everything that Elisa said. Um, working so closely with household surveys, I mean, at this point, I can't imagine ever going back to a paper survey. I think even countries with um, less capacity in this, in this area, I think that it is still possible, even if different regions of the country don't have as much access to internet connectivity, it's still possible and worthwhile to manage the survey in such a way that you know a team would be based in an area or make sure that they access an area at least once a week to upload the data, send it back to headquarters. And I, I think the benefits still very much outweigh the costs. It gives uh, the central headquarters team the opportunity to see the data in real time, provide the feedback so that teams can learn as the field work progresses. Um, so I think that it's really, really something that's critical at this point. Um, and because so many software are available and have all been so uniquely designed to make sure that they capture data um, in the way that we want it to be captured. So as Elisa was saying, you know, you can design each of the questions to make it very clear to both the enumerator and the respondent um, exactly what a question might mean and capture it in the best way possible. So I think that it's, at this point in time, it's really worth the, inv the upfront investment uh, because the benefits in terms of data quality and timeliness um, are worthwhile. All right. Thank you very much to both of you. It's time to wrap up and sorry for you. We had a lot of great questions. Uh, we didn't have enough time to respond, but please uh, email me and uh, let's keep in touch after the webinar and we'll continue uh, uh, the discussion. Uh, so the, thank you very much. Thank you to our two great presenters uh, to, uh, to have come today. And also wanted to announce our next webinar, which, we, which will be in one month. And the focus will be on how to put a business case for then, uh, uh, data disaggregation. So uh, if you are interested, please look up on Twitter and, uh, and uh, we'll announce it maybe two weeks before the webinar. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, have all, stay all safe and, uh, and uh, healthy. Bye, everybody. <laughs>